allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This evening, Council is grateful to have Pastor Simbo Anaya of the Christ International Community Church in person to pray with us. Pastor, thank you so much for being here. And thank you again. I had the honor of worshiping with Pastor yesterday at church. So thank you. Thank you. Good to see you again. Council President Harding and all members of the City Council, it's a great honor and privilege to be here this evening to pray with you. Thank you for inviting me. I bring greetings from my church. Let's bow our, head, bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for this opportunity to commune with you this evening and ask you to take your place in the affairs of our city. We thank you for all the blessings you have poured into this country, this state, and this city. Now we pray for peace in our world. We pray continued blessings, protection, peace, and prosperity for our country, the United States of America, for our state, and for our city. We declare by faith that this city of Columbus will be a godly city. We pray and declare that righteousness will prevail in this city. We pray for every leader in this city, the mayor, the city council president, all council members, and others in authority. I pray that they will lead justly and with godly wisdom. We pray for strength for them and that they be blessed. Father Lord, we pray and thank you for every member of this assembly gathered here to deliberate on the affairs of this city. Pray for your wisdom and knowledge for them as they lead the affairs of our city. Now we pray, blessed Lord, that you will guide their deliberations this evening and inspire them, O oh Lord, to make good decisions for this city. We pray that their deliberations will be done in an atmosphere of peace and civility. May this city become a city of hope for all our residents. And may our leaders serve the people with the fear and admonition of the Lord. And may this city, Columbus, Ohio, be a shining star amongst the city of this nation. In Jesus' blessed name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Horton. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dismiss with the reading of the journal? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Are there any additions or corrections to the journal? Seeing none, the journal is approved. This week's communication received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Not this time. Are there any resolutions or announcements by my colleagues, starting with Council Member Bankston? Uh, thank you, Council President Harden. Just a couple of announcements uh, I would like to share. Uh, last week I mentioned uh, that September is Sickle Cell Awareness Month and we're excited to celebrate it. Uh, tonight uh, I would like to highlight a resolution that is on uh, the consent portion of our agenda officially recognizing September as Sickle Cell Awareness Month in the city of Columbus. The resolution will be presented later uh, tonight during our lighting and award ceremony to Ms. Annie Womack, the director of the Ohio Sickle Cell Association. Uh, the ceremony officially starts at 8 p.m here on the Marconi side of uh, City Hall, and we'll conclude around 8.30, and we will light City Hall red this evening. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing everyone there uh, and also members of the public. Uh, in addition, uh, for Sickle Cell Awareness Month, as you know, we are hosting blood drives all uh, at city locations and encouraging our residents and also city staff to participate. We have two more blood drives scheduled for the remainder of the month, uh, one occurring this Thursday, September 22nd, next door at 770 North, uh, North Front Street, uh, and the second happening next Tuesday, September 26th, at Central Ohio Area Aging 
Agency on Aging's building located at 3776 South High Street. Both of these blood drives will run from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. I want to thank all of the city staff and residents that have went out to the first two uh, blood drives last week, and I hope that we continue to see strong participation uh, throughout the rest of the month. Lastly, as a reminder, tomorrow my office will be holding a public hearing to discuss potential changes to the Department of Development's wage threshold policy. Currently, only jobs that pay $15 per hour or more qualify for city tax incentives. Mm -hmm. This policy is up for review and has been determined that a higher wage for this threshold is necessary. Uh, the, the hearing is set to begin at 6 p.m. and will take place at American Floor Source, located at 2360 City Gate Drive, Columbus, Ohio, 43219. One, we wanted to make sure that we got out into the community uh, to make sure the residents could access us, but also an amazing story at American Floor Source who uh, had a city incentive and has grown by leaps and bounds and is expanding their location there uh, on the city's northeast side. Any resident seeking to submit written testimony should forward it to my legislative aide, J.P. Dorval, via his email at jb, as in boy, dorval, at columbus.gov. Again, that's J-B, D-O, R-V-A-L at Columbus.gov. Residents who want to provide testimony in person during the hearing also uh, email JP Dorval at the same email. Both in-person and written testimony should be submitted by 4 p.m. tomorrow. However, we will have witness uh, testimony slips available at the hearing just in case. So we look forward uh, to, to seeing you out tomorrow and this evening. And that's all I have uh, this evening, Council President. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you for your leadership on Sickle Cell. Awareness Month. Councilmember Rossetti Abadia. Good evening, Council President. I do have one resolution this evening and a couple of announcements, so I'll start with the resolution. So if we want to have our speaker come up towards the front. I would like to introduce resolution 0178X 2022 to acknowledge and support the peace efforts to stop human, right abuse, human rights abuses in Ethiopia and encourage Congress to pass the Ethiopia Peace and Stabilization Act of 2022. The bill aims to suspend any further United States financial and security assistance to the Ethiopian government in an effort to bring an end to the conflict taking place there. Columbus is home to thousands of Ethiopian immigrants, migrants, and refugees. Columbus's strength and vibrancy is based on our community's diversity. All people deserve to live in conflict-free zones and areas of peace. And the Columbus City Council stands in solidarity with the people of Tigray and Ethiopian immigrant and refugee communities around the world and especially here in Columbus. We believe in fundamental human rights for all people and finding a peaceful resolution to the, in the Tigray nation. Um, everyone deserves to feel safe. And I want to thank um, Moses Hayelum who is here this uh, evening with us. I had the opportunity to go out and be in community with you and your church on one of the high holidays. And I believe breaking bread is one of the best ways to be proximate to each other and hearing the stories and knowing my own family came here out of conflict, out of a place seeking safety and seeking refuge. Um, I understand at least on a fundamental level, what your community is facing now when you're so far away from home, so far away from the people that you love and watching them struggle. So with that, I want to hand over the floor to you, Moses. Thank you, Council Member Lotus. Um, and good evening, Council President Hardin and Columbus City Council. My name is Moses Hayalom, and I am here on behalf of the Tigray community of Columbus. Thank you for adopting this resolution and recognizing humanitarian crisis in Ethiopia, particularly in Tigray. We appreciate you acknowledging and supporting peace efforts to stop human rights abuses in Ethiopia and encouraging Congress to pass H.R. 6600, the Ethiopia Stabilization, Peace, and Democracy Act of 2022, and Senate Resolution 3199. Since November 2020, there has been a devastating humanitarian crisis in Ethiopia's northernmost region, state Tigray. Just this past week, there have been four drone attacks in Tigray by the federal government on civilians targeting a neighborhood, McKellar University, the only functioning hospital in the area, and a kindergarten that claimed seven, the seven lives of children. We just informed our community member on Thursday that her civilian sister had been killed in one of those recent indiscriminate drone strikes. We are all still mourning, mourning with her. 
Our community members have sleepless nights not knowing if their families have been impacted in any air raids or ones to come. Due to the telecommunications blackout since November 2020, they haven't been able to communicate with their families. In fact, the UN has called the restricted access to the Tigray region a de facto humanitarian aid blockade, and Amnesty International confirms this blockade also includes the shutdown of telecommunications, electricity, which is damaging the clean water supply, banking services, and cut off infrastructure access for aid workers to the region, all of which is hampering the humanitarian response and exacerbating the crisis. Furthermore, President Joe Biden released a statement about the ongoing crisis in northern Ethiopia, stating nearly one million people are living in famine-like conditions and millions more face acute food insecurity as a direct consequence of the violence. Humanitarian workers have been blocked, harassed, and killed. The President further emphasizes, I am appalled by the reports of mass murder, rape, and other sexual violence to terrorize civilian populations, followed by sanctioning the individuals and entities perpetrating the violence and driving a humanitarian disaster. Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Bob Menendez, is calling what is happening in Tigray a genocide. As many of us know, there are globally publicized crises occurring, but little attention has been focused on this war escalating in the Horn of Africa from the international community, despite the overwhelming evidence of a Tigrayan genocide over the past two years. So I thank you again for joining the aforementioned brave individuals who choose to speak out against the atrocities happening in Ethiopia, and for standing with the Tigray community of Columbus and its members, many of whom have not heard from their families in two years, and are still pushing every day and fighting every day to raise awareness for peace and to seek support from all levels of government to pass S3199 and HR 6600 in hopes to reunite and restore broken links with their families. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. Are there any comments from my colleagues? I just wanted to say again, thank you. I know that you're here with your family and you're representing many more people here today. Thank you for your continued advocacy, not just for your people, but for all the people of Columbus. And thank you for everything that you do in our community and pouring into the vibrancy of Columbus. Thank you. So with that, I move for adoption. Second. President Bangston, Barosa Di Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Hardin. Adopt it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I do have a few announcements this evening. First, I would like um, to share with everyone to save the date. Um, I'm excited to share that on this Thursday, the 22nd at 2.30, we will officially be announcing our 614 beautiful be uh, neighborhood beautification grants. Okay. And so we'll do that at Third Way Cafe. You can see the logos right up there. The goal of these beautification grants is that um, we deeply believe that every part of Columbus is beautiful and it deserves even more beauty. So this gives community members and organizations the opportunity to access funds so that they can create, whether it's a mural or a pocket park or some sort of gathering location in their community, we're trying to remove barriers to put resources back into our neighborhoods. So I wanna thank um, Director William Scott, who is our partner um, in the Department of Neighborhoods and the Neighborhood Design Center, who has been our great partner leading on this along with some other community members. Um, we're excited to see all the wonderful projects that will come from this effort. So this Thursday, uh, the 22nd, 2.30, at um, Third Way Cafe, and then we'll be sharing more. We do have a website, www.614beautiful.org. Visit that for more information. So that's my first announcement. Secondly, I want to thank everyone who came out this weekend to kick off the Latine Hispanic Heritage Month inaugural parade. I want to thank all of our council colleagues who were there. I want to give a shout out to the community members that helped to plan it, all of the volunteers, especially my staff who has been working for months to put this um, on. I think it was a display, again, of the celebration of the culture, the different cultures and the vibrantness of Columbus. It was also an opportunity to bring people back into Columbus on Saturday. There were a lot of things happening, but folks were coming back downtown and we had a party out in our placita right here at City Hall. So I wanna thank um, everyone who was here and celebrated with us. There's uh, many more events coming out throughout the month and we'll be sharing those. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna close by acknowledging the, um, 
uh, the island of Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic who have been hit hard by Hurricane Fiona. And here in Columbus, we have a large uh, Puerto Rican and Dominican uh, community. And I know much like my family, my staff's family who has family in Puerto Rico, we've been uh, worried watching the devastation of the flooding and the continued rains, especially when they're still reeling from uh, Hurricane Maria that happened years ago. And so we're sending our thoughts um, both to our community here, but especially the community that is on the island. It's always hard, as we talked about before, to watch your friends and loved ones um, suffering from far away and to not be able to communicate is really difficult. Um, I also want to take this time that we can all do a little bit right, um, whether there are relief efforts that you're gonna hear coming out in the next couple of days to help the people in Puerto Rico, but also here at home. There's small little things that we can do to continue to protect the environment because these natural disasters that we are seeing are growing because we need to continue to care for our Mother Earth, right? To care for the land and the air that we breathe. Um, we just saw this in Columbus a couple weeks ago with record rains happening in different parts of the city and flooding different parts of the city, and we'll continue to see that. So everybody can do just a little bit to make, um, you know, to make this a healthier place for all of us. So again, um, sending our love uh, to the Puerto Rican community here and especially abroad. Thank you. Thank you for that. Vice Pro Tem. Uh, I don't have any announcements, Council President, but I wanted to say congratulations again to mm -hmm. Councilmember Barroso de Padilla on a really, really um, inspiring day on Saturday, um, uh, at the inaugural year, I know. But um, uh, thank you for your, for your kind and wise words and compassionate words just now as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and it feels funny to put those things right next to each other, the celebration and the devastation. Um, so thank you for being real with both and congratulations on Saturday. Council Member, Council Member Favor. Thank you, Council President Harton. I have uh, one resolution and two announcements. At this time, I would like to invite uh, the Swanton family up to the podium and two special young ladies, Cora and Quinn. Tonight, we have ordinance, or resolution, excuse me, 0166X-2022 to declare September 2022 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the city of Columbus. Childhood cancer is the number one cause of death from disease among children, and according to the American Childhood Cancer Organization, each year, 16,790 children are diagnosed with cancer in the United States. Additionally, approximately 40,000 children are actively receiving treatment at any given time, and half of childhood cancer families will be faced with significant out-of-pocket expenses as a result of this illness. There are too many children affected by this deadly disease. More must be done to raise awareness and to find a cure. Thank you to the many organizations and research institutions that continue to work on finding a cure and supporting our children and families going through this. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to the Swanton family. President Hardin, city council members and community members, I would like to say thank you for allowing our family to be here this evening. My name is Sarah, this is my husband, Matthew, and our two daughters, um, Cora and Quinn. And uh, this month is very near and dear to our hearts because our youngest daughter, Sloan, was a cancer warrior. But cancer is the reason she is not here with us today. Sloan was born on March 5th, 2020, just one week before the pandemic shut down Ohio. She came nine days early and was our little miracle. You see, she had a true knot in her umbilical cord. So when she was born, we discovered the knot, and luckily it never tightened, which never caused any problems during her birth. Our family of four became a party of five, and uh, believe it or not, our time in quarantine was truly the best days of our lives. Um, Sloan was the absolute best baby, minus these two, they were wonderful as well. <laughs> um, and I know all parents say this, but uh, there was an undeniable magic that surrounded her um, while many people complained about quarantine and too much time at home and too much time with their loved ones, I know it gets a little crazy being cramped, uh, 2020 was literally the best years of our lives. 
and uh, it was the year we didn't know we needed. In May of 2021, at the age of 14 months old, Sloan seemed to be consistently fighting ear infections. After three different antibiotics and surgery to put tubes in her ears, it was apparent that, to us that something was not right. We pushed and we pushed our pediatricians for answers. It wasn't until May 26, when we asked for blood work and a CT scan, that we were told that Sloan had a mass in her head. They never used the word tumor or brain cancer, so we held out hope that what we were dealing with was operable and survivable. Sloan went from a babbling, chasing, chasing her sisters, giggling toddler, to be unable to walk, speak, or eat in a matter of one week. Sloan was paralyzed on the left side of her body and the right side of her face because of the tumor. She had brain surgery on June 2nd to remove as much tumor as possible. Unfortunately, though, the tumor was pushing into Sloan's brain stem and had grown around multiple nerves, making it unsafe to remove. We were told that Sloan had a poorly differentiated clival cordoma and that we needed to start emergency chemotherapy. We were told there was a plan. We asked if we should go to St. Jude's to treat her tumor. We had never heard of cordoma. We didn't know that it was typically a tumor found in adults between between the ages of 50 and 60, and that it was a slow-growing tumor with a treatment plan. We didn't know that pediatric chordoma is an extremely aggressive tumor, and most children with it do not survive. We didn't know that there is no treatment plan for pediatric chordoma. We didn't know that the chemotherapy drugs we were putting into our baby girl were so toxic that we had to wear gloves to change her diaper for fear of us getting the effects of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy started working. Our daughter was able to come off a ventilator and breathe again on her own. She was relearning how to sit up, hold toys, crawl, and even walk again. She even started to talk a little again. Though we spent our summer in the hospital, Sloan was alive and getting better. She was even allowed to come home for two weeks to be with her sisters and us. For two weeks, we had our family under one roof and back together. You see, Sloan went into the hospital on May 28th and stayed there for a total of 96 days before she died. We were so hopeful that chemo was working and that our baby girl was beating cancer, that she was beating chordoma. But then Sloan began to lose the use of her left arm again. We slowly watched our daughter lose all she had regained. We were told that it was just swelling around her tumor. It wasn't swelling, though. The tumor became chemo-resistant, and the tumor was growing again. In September, Sloan underwent a second brain surgery when it was confirmed that the tumor was, in fact, growing again. We were told again they were unable to remove any of the tumor due to its location. This time, it was decided that we were going to transport Sloan to the Wexner Medical Center to undergo radiation therapy. We were told that this wasn't a Hail Mary, that there were options, and this was the best one right now. I wish we could have never agreed to that because on Sloan's ambulance ride back to Nationwide, on September 14th, 2021, she died. Sloan was 18 months old. She died with us, not by her side. She died without her sisters being able to see her. She died with strangers in an ambulance. None of us knew we wouldn't be able to say goodbye, and we couldn't have held her one last time, and we didn't get to tell her how much we loved her. Cancer killed our daughter. Cancer killed their sister. Over 100 chemotherapy drugs have been approved for adult use in the last 40 years. Yet the chemotherapy drugs they gave Sloan were over 50 years old and approved for adult use originally. Cyclophosphamide, 1959. Then Christine, 1963. Doxyrubicin, called the Red Devil, 1974. Those were three drugs we gave to our baby. Only six chemotherapy drugs have been approved for initial use in children. There are 12 types of childhood cancers with over 100 subtypes, yet the federal government sets aside only 4% of their yearly cancer research budget for children, childhood cancer. This is about the amount of money Americans spend at Starbucks in just three days. Where is that outrage? Would that be good enough if it was your child, your mom, your spouse, yourself? 
104,944 people can fit in the seats at the shoe for an Ohio State football game. This year, three times as many children globally will be diagnosed with cancer. Three times as many children that can fit in that stadium will be diagnosed with cancer this year alone. Let that sink in for a moment. You think seeing your children grow up fast is hard. Try putting yourself in the shoes of a cancer family. Some of us don't get to see our children grow up at all. On September 27th to 29th, the State House will be displaying pictures of childhood cancer warriors, survivors, and angels. Sloan's picture will be there. Please look for her. Please say her name. Please tell her story, our story. Please allow this to spur you into action, to contact your state representatives and senators, to push the agenda towards more research into childhood cancer, to allow children like Sloan, who no longer have a voice, to be the reason there is change in this country, to be the reason someone lives after a childhood cancer diagnosis, because there is funding, funding and there is an urgency to find a cure. Sloan deserved to live. She deserved so much more. Thank you. Mr. Swanton. I, I was just going to add that uh, we were able to donate Sloan's brain for, for for medical research and to help future families to help with you know potentially creating a uh, um, some type of uh, program so that families in the future don't have to go through what we went through so uh, if anything we're going to continue continue to push that and continue to fight for funding and continue to do what we can to raise money in the in this space as well thank you Mrs. Swanton, Mr. Swanton, uh, there are no words that can be said. And I speak quite candidly about how we allow the greatest pains of our lives to guide our purpose, our calling. And the remarks that you just made, I am absolutely speechless. It's almost, it's just been a year. Mm -hmm. And the courage, the strength, the resolve that you just demonstrated in front of this body, in front of this audience of strangers to talk about your child, that is a mother's strength. And I am so incredibly saddened by the loss of baby Sloan. She's a beautiful girl. You have a beautiful family. But this is why we do this. And oftentimes it feels like it falls flat, that they're just resolutions. But half of this audience did not know the reach of childhood cancer. Today they know. The next time they go to an OSU football stadium, they will think about the example that you gave today. The next time they get a cup of coffee, they will think about what they can do to support families that are in your situation today. So I thank you for your strength. Despite your grief, despite the pain that you're in, for sharing your story with all of us here today. Do any of my colleagues have anything they would like to offer at this time. We are going to, later on this week, tonight we're lighting City Hall red in honor of raising awareness for sickle cell. But from September 23rd to September 30th, you will also see City Hall illuminated gold in honor of Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. And if you are praying individuals, I'd ask you to lift 
the Swanton family up in prayer as they continue to grieve the loss, this unconceivable loss of their baby. Uh, with that, I would uh, move for adoption. Thanks, Sin, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Oh, before I leave, I, I had the opportunity to have um, Ms. Cora and Quinn up here on the dais with me to hand these amazing pins out. Ladies, would you like to tell the audience what these pins are about? Yes, you can, use the, you can move the mic. These pins are about um, how some people have um, have child. This these pins are about um, how everybody should oh support childhood cancer. That's right. Great job. Great job. <laughs> are you ready for your debut? <laughs> she could take it off if you want. It's all right. She said she was thinking about it, so we'll see. Thank you. And then just very quickly, Council President, um, applications for the Columbus Youth Council program are available. All Columbus City School juniors and seniors are encouraged to apply. For information about the program, students can visit www.columbus.gov slash CYC. And this Wednesday, this Wednesday, September 21st, marks the date that black women have to work into the new year to finally catch up to what white non-Hispanic men earned last year. Residents interested in joining the Columbus Women's Commission's Black Women's Equal Pay Day campaign can join their Twitter storm at 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. and demand equal pay on hashtag Black Women's Equal Pay Day. That's all I have, Council President. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Remy. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Council President. Um, I have two brief announcements. First, I would like to recognize and celebrate this, that starting this Friday is National Drive Electric Week. Drive Electric Week celebrates the transition to hybrid and plug-in electric vehicles by drivers across the country and here in Columbus, Ohio. I want to invite everyone to two great upcoming events occurring in Columbus in celebration of National Drive Electric Week. First, Smart Columbus will host Drive Electric with Easton on Saturday, September 24th from 11 to 4 to raise awareness about reducing carbon emissions, promote environmentally friendly transportation, and alternative mobility options through driving electric. See the new F-150 Lightning, Tesla, Rivian, and other electric vehicles up close. Experience an electric bike, e-scooter, and learn about solar energy. Also explore different charging options for your vehicles and transportation needs. Second, Drive Electric Columbus, along with Columbus Yellow Cab and Clean Fuels Ohio, will host an event on Saturday, October 1st from 10 to 2 at the headquarters of Columbus Yellow Cab. The U.S. Department of Energy selected Clean Fuels Ohio for a $1.36 million project conducted from 19 to 2022 to explore new innovative solutions to transportation, energy, and technology integration challenges. This project created a decentralized and electrified mobility ecosystem in partnership with Columbus's Yellow Cab, growing their growing fleet of electric vehicles. The location of the event on October 1st features one of the decentralized mobility ecosystem hubs. As climate change demands us to adapt and create new ways to move, our local partners and city initiatives are meeting the demand. I hope you'll consider attending one or both of the events to learn more. Second, I will be hosting uh, my September community hours on Monday, September 26th from 12 to 1.30, virtually on WebEx. This is a great opportunity to share ideas and questions with me and my staff. All are welcome to RSVP. Please email my legislative assistant, Lucy Frank, at ljfrank at columbus.gov. That's ljfrank at columbus.gov. Thank you, Council President. That's all I have this evening. Thank you, Councilmember Remy. Uh, are there uh, any comments by our elected officials, the city attorney's office, auditor, uh, city treasurer? 
Uh, at this time, I request the following ordinance be removed from the consent portion of the agenda. Uh, utilities Ordinance 0180X-2022. Are there any other requests by members for consent to be moved from the agenda? All right, may we now have a motion to waive reading of titles of 30-day legislation on tonight's agenda? So moved. please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa D. Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, Council, President Harden. Thank you. Will the clerk now read to the record the ordinance number of 30-day legislation on tonight's agenda? Technology Committee, Ordinance 2407-2022. Public Service and Transportation Committee, Ordinance 2421-2022. Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 2408 and 2412-2022. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, speakers on first reading? No speakers on first reading. The following ordinances appear on our agenda as consent action. Will the clerk now read those ordinances into the record? Resolutions of Expression 175X and 176X-2022, Economic Development Committee, Ordinance 2271-2022, Technology Committee, Ordinance 1986-2022, Public Service and Transportation Committee, Ordinances 2194, 2320, 2358, 2389, 2405, 2420, 2461 2022 Finance Committee, Resolution 165X-2022, Public Utilities Committee, Ordinance 2178, 2185, 2203, 2212, 2225, 2242, 2273, 2321, 2362 2022 Housing Committee, Ordinances 2446 and 2484-2022, Criminal Justice and Judiciary Committee, Ordinance 23. 17-2022, Health and Human Services Committee, Ordinances 2365, 2411, 2433, 2439-2022, Public Safety Committee, Ordinance 2379-2022, Environment Committee, Ordinance 2416-2022, Administration Committee, Ordinances 2342, 2443, 2444-2502-2505-2022, Appointments from the Mayor's Office numbered a0164, 189, 190, 191, and 192-2022. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have uh, one consent agenda speaker, Mr. Nate Wilkins. Mr. Wilkins, welcome back to Council. Mr. Wilkins is speaking on uh, Ordinance 2271 in the Economic Development Committee. Found on page three. Mr. Los Angeles, welcome 1612 Arlington Avenue, North, uh, North London, Columbus. Um, I'm speaking in uh, favor of this, but there's a couple questions I got to ask. The property I'm speaking about, 1725 South Parsons Avenue, I, I guess this was a shoe repair shop a couple years ago, and I would like to know the historical history of this property. To my knowledge, I put up the uh, Franklin County Auditor's website today, and I, I believe it's a small piece of property. I don't know how long it has sit vacant. I, don't, I, I guess it was occupied with some time with Brothers Shoe Repair. Maybe just throwing out a guessing of a information of a word here, um, I would think this probably was operated back in 1980s, 70s, 60s, or something like that. But to my knowledge, if this is a historical property and it's in a small business, um, if I can just a few things. I know this is on the uh, south side of Parsons Avenue. If we're going to bring something like back this to that community, we want it to be a larger scale of this. I believe this is a unique property, can be idolized for all type of people to bring job opportunities. And again, it's a great opportunity, but in a smaller building, almost something that's 30,000 square feet on that site or somewhere can be in the central Ohio area that's located on the bus line where people can move, hustle and bustle. But again, I would like to have more clarification, why is this property 
is on the historical <coughs> property registration. Thank you for your time. Director. Thank you, President Hardin, members of council. Uh, what this ordinance does is it puts this property on the um, historic registry for the city of Columbus. I'm going to ask our historic um, commit, uh, individual who runs our Historic Resource Commission to uh, follow up with Mr. Wilkins and, and go into the deep dive detail of, of the history behind the site. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments on this ordinance or any other uh, on the consent portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may we now have a motion for approval of these items as made as consent? Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston. Yes, with the exception of Ordinance 2411-2022 and Appointment A0164-2022, from which I'm abstaining. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes, with the exception of 2420, on which I'm abstaining. Mr. Dorrance? Yes. Ms. Faber? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Hardin? Yes. Uh, consent portion of the agenda carries. Uh, just joking. Yes, with the exception of 2178-2020, uh, in which I'm abstaining. Are we good? All right. The consent portion of the agenda carries with the noted exceptions. We will now proceed with second reading of 30 day tabled and emergency legislation. The first committee to come before council is the finance committee chaired by Press Pro Tem. President Pro Tem, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, council president. Um, tonight in finance, we have ordinance 2318-2022 to authorize the appropriation of $8,220,000 within the general fund and to declare an emergency. On June 15th, the city auditor published a revision to the 2022 estimate of available resources into the general operating fund. As a result of uh, positive revenue variances in income tax and other categories, the official 2022 revenue estimate was increased. So this ordinance authorizes the appropriation and transfer of resources within general operating to be used for 3 million fleet citywide vehicle purchases, 4 million increased to fire division personnel from mid-contract negotiations, 20,000 uh, to the Inspector General's Office training and memberships for the Civilian Review Board, uh, 1.2 million for judges personnel uh, due to the, a salary study and related increases. Emergency act action is requested today at it, as it is immediately necessary to update the general fund appropriation and related funds uh, to the new estimate as published by the city auditor on June 15th in advance of the close of the quarter. Any questions or comments from colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hart. Pass. Uh, thank you. Next is Ordinance 2290-2022 to authorize the Finance and Management Director on behalf of Fleet Management to establish purchase orders from previously held UTCs for the purchase of vehicles for use by the Department of Public Safety, Department of Development, Department of Finance, uh, Department of Public Service, and Department of Recreation and Parks with Byers Ford, Par Public Safety, and Reichert Properties to authorize the Finance and Management Director to establish purchase orders from DAS cooperative contracts for the purchase of related vehicle upfitting, to authorize the Finance and Management Director to establish <coughs> purchase orders for additional vehicle upfitting needs, which will be purchased in accordance with the competitive bidding provisions of City Code Chapter 329, to authorize the expenditure of $3 million from the general fund to authorize the appropriation expenditure of $4,247,484 from the special income tax fund and to declare an emergency. Uh, the vehicle purchases in this ordinance are replacements for older, high mileage, high maintenance, and out of life cycle vehicles currently in service and are more fuel efficient and will relieve the city of maintenance expenses. Due to the instability of the automobile supply chain, emergency action is requested so that orders can be placed as soon as possible. Questions from colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. May I move to education? Please. Committee? 
in education, we have Ordinance 2274-2022 to authorize the Director of the Office of Education to enter into a contract with HMB Learning Circle Software, LLC, to provide ongoing technical support for the Seahive data platform, a program necessary to achieve the mayor's goal that every four-year-old in Columbus has access to a high-quality pre-kindergarten education, to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Codes, and to authorize the expenditure of $186,047 uh, uh, from the general fund. This legislation allows for HMB Learning Circle software to continue providing technical support to Seahive which is a cloud-based web application that pre-K providers use to, uh, for enrollment, assessment, and attendance data. It allows teachers to make real-time decisions on instruction. The Office of Education has used Seahive to help improve program outcomes and increase effectiveness through its unique dashboard and reporting capabilities. HMB Learning Circle Software has been providing this technical support to Seahive since 2018, which is the reason for the request to waive competitive bidding. Any questions? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bangston, Barossa, De Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. And my last ordinance in education is 2275-2022 to authorize the director of the Office of Education to enter into a contract with the Crane Center for Early Childhood Research and Policy at the Ohio State University to implement Ready for Success a screening and improvement strategy, read it again, read it again, math, and to provide a mid-year student assessment to allow the Crane Center to spend a 2021 balance authorized by Ordinance 1408-2021 and to authorize the expenditure of $400,000 from the general fund. As chair of the Education Committee, many of you, I would venture to say maybe all of you, have heard me say that by the age of five, 90% of a child's brain has developed making the progression from birth to kindergarten the most significant brain development period in their lives. So I am pleased that the mayor and our council are working actively to bring awareness and resources to this critical learning stage in childhood development. The Ready for Success initiative was funded for the 21-22 year to improve children's outcomes and kindergarten readiness. Through this ordinance, Ready for Success aims to continue the efforts of their program by using a multi-pronged strategy to support providers in preparing ch children for kindergarten success. For the 22-23 academic year, the Crane Center staff will continue to implement, implement excuse me, RIA, read it again, an evidence-based, low-cost instructional supplement designed to promote intentional teaching practices in early childhood education programs serving children from birth all the way to age five. Offering IRA to all early childhood providers is aligned with the Future Ready by Five strategic plan, Driver One, which is providing development and education supports for all children. In addition to RIA, Crane Center staff will also develop and implement RIA Math, a math curriculum supplement, and will conduct a mid-year student assessment. The Crane Center has been chosen because there is no employee expertly positioned to do this work within the city, but there is at the Crane Center. For the past five school years, the Office of Education has contracted and partnered with Crane to expand the Early Start Columbus program, and there is no other entity with the kind of experience and expertise for this program. Any questions or comments from colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. By voice. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Bankston? Yes. Ms. Barosa de Padilla? Yes. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Ordinance is passed. That's all I have, President Harden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next committee to come before council is the Public Utilities Committee, chaired by Councilmember Dorans. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Uh, tonight in Public Utilities, we have Ordinance 2324-2022 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter in a service contract with J&D &J &D Home Improvements, Inc., doing business as the basement doctor for the D Division of Sewers and Drainage Voluntary Sub Pump 2022 program to weigh the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Codes to authorize the transfer and expenditure of up to $2,537,390 within the Sanitary General Obligation Voted Bond Fund to provide for the payment of prevailing wage services to the Department of Public service and to authorize an amendment to the 2022 capital improvement budget. 
Um, this project is one of the four main pillars of the blueprint process and consists of residents volunteering for installation of sub pumps in their homes in the Clintonville and Hilltop areas to reduce excess storm water entering the city's sanitary sewer system. Uh, this project will cover approximately 500 properties that represent 25% target uh, participation rates in areas of the Hilltop and Clintonville. Don't my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clark, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Pass. Um, next, we have Ordinance 2400-2022 to authorize the Director of the Department of Public Utilities to enter into a new water and sewer sanitary sewer service agreements with the City of Dublin and declare an emergency. Uh, at this time, at the request of the Department of Public Utilities, I move to refer this legislation back to the Public Utilities Committee. I need a second. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to re uh, go back to uh, resolution number 0810X-2022 from the consent agenda um, to appoint a board of revision to hear the objections of the Morningstar slash North 40 Street lighting uh, assessment project and declare an emergency. Uh, in order to accommodate uh, an updated location for the border, board, this board of revision to occur, I am also moving to refer this legislation back to the Public Utilities Committee. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Referred back to committee. Thank you, Council President. So I'll have my committees at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next committee to come before Council is the Criminal Justice and Judiciary Committee, chaired by Councilmember Favor. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Harton. Tonight in Criminal Justice and Judiciary, uh, we have Ordinance 2518-2022 to authorize and direct the city attorney to settle the lawsuit captioned Timothy Hawkins versus Brian Williams et al. United States District Court case number 221CV4291 to authorize the expenditure of the sum of $375,000 and zero cents and settlement of the lawsuit and to declare an emergency in July 2020. Detective Brian Williams filed a warrant which led to Mr. Hawkins' arrest. Mr. Hawkins alleged he was arrested and charged without probable cause in violation of his Fourth and Fifteenth Amendment rights. Uh, tonight we're joined by Attorney Brian Shen. Uh, do you mind providing us with some additional information regarding the sett settlement? Thank you, uh, Chair Favor, Council President, and members of Council. Uh, as you said, Chair Favor, this uh, ordinance is to seeking council's approval of a settlement of this lawsuit. Um, Mr. Hawkins um, asserts that his constitutional rights were violated and that there were associated tort claims related to his arrest and his imprisonment based upon uh, a strip search and a body cavity search. Uh, Mr. Hawkins was imprisoned from September 15, 2020 until uh, September 21st, 2020, when the charges were dismissed. After review, it was determined that there were problems with the witness's identification of Mr. Hawkins. Uh, so the city attorney's office recommends that this settlement is in the best interest of the city to avoid a potential jury award or of damages and an award of attorney's fees and uh, I would be happy to answer any questions that council has. Are there any additional questions or comments by my colleagues at this time? Seeing none, I'd move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. Uh, President Harden, may I move on to Health and Human Services? Please. Tonight in Health and Human Services Committee, we have Ordinance 2519 to authorize the director of the Department of Development to enter into a not-for-profit service contract with the Community Shelter Board in an amount up to $300,000 for the Transitional Housing Pilot Program, to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of $300,000 from the Neighborhood Economic Development Fund and to declare an emergency. Last week, all 13 individuals staying at the 897 East Mound Street encampment joined a pilot program that place them in temporary housing at a hotel so they may reside in a safe and stable environment while they pursue the process of securing long-term housing. Pilot participants are receiving hotel lodging, meals, 
bus passes, and indiv individualized case management as they work to transition into subsidized rental or permanent supportive housing. To date, all participants are still housed on site. One resident has already been referred to rapid rehousing and another's referral should be happening soon. Through this pilot, we hope to better understand equitable options for people who have not successfully exited the shelter system. This program will help prepare individuals to take on permanent housing and its responsibility by providing them a mailing address, access to a telephone, relief from inclement weather, and the opportunity to prioritize the long-term goals of health and housing security. The pilot will be managed by the Community Shelter Board with Equitas Health, providing on-site case management tailored to the needs of each individual. Director Stevens, is there anything additional you'd like to add at this time? Thank you, um, President Hardin, Chair Favor, members of council. I would just add that outreach to unsheltered homeless individuals continues daily in our community, and anyone experienced unsheltered homelessness could call the Community Shelter Board's 24-hour hotline at 614-274-7000. Thank you. Thank you, and I, would, I know that we are joined by a few of, of our housing advocates that have been working specifically with the individuals that have uh, been residing at the 897 Mound Street location. Just like to take this opportunity to thank you for your continued advocacy uh, for those who are unable to advocate for themselves. We have to continue to work collaboratively uh, to support our most vulnerable residents, and we understand and know um, and recognize uh, the, the great work that you're doing to make sure that uh, just the basic needs are met uh, on the ground and helping to fill in the gaps uh, where the city uh, was unable to. So thank you uh, for that. I do believe we have two speakers present uh, this evening uh, that would like to speak. Uh, we are joined by Mr. Joe Miltill. Welcome back to council. Good evening, uh, Joe Motel, 167 West Cook Road, Columbus, Ohio, President Harden, Pro Tem Brown, members of City Council. A transitional housing pilot program, or even a transitional housing policy program by our mayor and City Council is long overdue. You might have thought at the very least that the embarrassment of our city from the 60 Minutes program that aired in March of 2021 that displayed just a tiny segment of our suffering homeless residents would have generated an immediate response to action from city officials for transitional housing. The 60 Minutes program also clearly unveiled our city's disgraced record of being ranked as the second most economically city in America. After reading this ordinance's, quote, background explanation that has been provided to each of you and to the public, I do have a few questions. Excuse me. Are meals being provided to the residents? And if so, where is the food coming from? And as it is, it is everyone's hope if and when a resident of this particular pilot program is prepared to, quote, establish themselves into permanent housing and living, shall that person's spot be filled by another homeless person who is, quote, living on the land? Will this pilot program end the city's bulldozer policy of homeless encampments from the environmental remediation contractor firm? Is the city going to finally begin providing porta johns and 10 yard dumpsters for various homeless encampments in order to avoid the city from siting encampments with health and sanitation violations? Is the city council and the mayor going to agree that the matters of homelessness are better suited being under the purview of the Department of Health? And now that the residents of Camp Shameless have finally been relocated to transitional housing, is this city and mayor going to do the right thing and repurpose this taxpayer-owned property at 897 East Mound Street into transitional affordable housing by constructing tiny homes? This property has been vacant for 15 years now, and it is my understanding that according to deed restrictions, the property must be used for affordable housing. And that doesn't mean selling this property to a luxury real estate developer who gets a 15-year, 100% tax abatement, this is in a CRA area, and then maybe provides a handful of set-aside units, and then you falsely claim that the new development is an affordable housing project. I would like to hear the answers to my questions this evening, and we'll gladly repeat them if necessary. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Moto. Uh, Director Stevens, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, President Hardin, Chair Favors, members of council. Um, we are providing meals. I need to follow up with Mr. Motillo and talk to the shelter board to understand who the provider of those meals are. I don't have that information today. Um, we continue to um, work with our unsheltered population who's living on the land, um, but we will continue to remediate sites in the best, um, you know, public self safety, health, and welfare of the community. Um, we're encouraged by uh, how quickly those residents who have been moved into this pilot program have been referred to the rapid rehousing. Um, to answer the question, will we backfill one of those 13? I don't have an answer to that today, but we will work with our partners on that to explore that uh, option as well. Um, I'll be honest, I don't recall every question that was uh, posed, but uh, we'll continue to um, work on our commitment to housing uh, across the continuum, whether it's, it's homeless, affordable market rate, it's a, a critical issue in this community and we'll continue to work on that. The $300,000 is good till I believe September of 24, so I would assume that that meant that those 13 re uh, rooms should be available at all times. Mr. Monto, if you don't mind sending your remarks to my office and I will get them to the department and we'll make sure that every single question gets answered. Thank you, Mr. Moto. Again, the city needs to be held. More, you, you all say you need to be held. You want to be held accountable, so you need to be held accountable. You need to know the answers to these questions before you give it, give out money. Next, we have Rachel Winning, and I apologize if I misstated your last name. Welcome to council. Members of council, thank you for letting me speak tonight. Uh, my name is Rachel Wenning. I am an area commissioner in the Hilltop. Uh, I'm an attorney. I got involved with uh, the Camp Shameless and the organizers working with the residents there um, fairly recently, um, especially just to avoid their displacement. Um, I am speaking in favor of this ordinance, but kind of with some reservations. <clears throat> and I think some of my comments might um, answer a few of Mr. Motil's questions. Because in speaking with some of the organizers today, um, there are some concerns with the services that are being provided so far uh, to the former Camp Shameless residents. Uh, the meals that are being provided to the residents uh, so far are not consistently edible. Um, I know a few of um, the residents have sent kind of pictures of what they've been provided with so far, uh, and they've been overcooked and just not really edible. Um, and our understanding is that the food is being brought to them from the Van Buren shelter, um, which I think brings up a greater concern that that's the same food that's being served to people at Van Buren. Um, and you know, what are we serving to people? Um, and why are we not providing them with something that's you know, as tasteful and um, healthy as something that we would wanna eat ourselves? Um, so that's one concern. Um, another part of the funding, and I know that Mr. Harewood uh, included this in his testimony that he submitted, but um, part of the funding is to provide transportation uh, for the residents to be able to get to appointments and to, uh, to their jobs and such. Um, right now, there's only four group bus passes or monthly bus passes that have been provided to them, um, and there's 13 of them. So that's not adequate at this point. Um, they're continuing to work on getting them more bus passes, but um, there are a couple of individuals who uh, you know, have jobs to get to, and one of them works a lot closer to the camp um, than the current location, um, and he's having to get up and get on the bus at 5 a.m. to get to work at 7 a.m., so um, that's another issue that I think could use continued work. Um, and I just want to note, you know, as all of us have stable housing, I don't think it's um, something that I have to remember, and I hope that council remembers as well, um, is that this is a big change for them. Like it seems like an automatically positive thing, right? To have a stable roof over your head, but they formerly had their own space in their tents, didn't have to share with anyone else. Right now they're two to a room. Um, some of them are very much struggling with that emotionally. Um, being forced to share space, not having a kitchen to cook in for themselves. Um, and so this is a very um, stressful and difficult thing for them. 
Um, so I think that's just something else to consider going forward um, in how services are provided to them. Um, again, I am speaking in favor of this, but we understand that this pilot program is rushed, so it's not a perfect situation. Um, but I essentially just want to be here, and I think the other advocates want to be here to make sure that you all know that we're continuing to work with um, the four residents. Basically, we're going to continue to advocate for them. So um, we hope that you continue to provide more for them and to address the root cause um, hmm. in creating more housing that's available because this is kind of a Band-Aid rather than a solution to the problem. Thank you. Absolutely, and, and thank you um, for your, your testimony this evening. Um, Director Stevens, do you have any? Thank you, President Hardin, Chair Favor, members of council. Uh, appreciate these issues being raised. We will follow up with the shelter board and uh, have a better understanding of how the meals are being prepared and, and delivered, uh, as well as making sure those bus passes are provided. That's a critical part of transportation, so we will work on that and appreciate uh, that being raised. Absolutely, and as you did indicate, this, this is a quick response uh, on behalf of the city to respond uh, to um, a, a situation uh, that needed to be addressed as quickly as possible. Um, yes, if we had additional time, all of these things would be uh, even more fleshed out than what they are already. Uh, but I, I think that our quick response demonstrates, and I, I say quick um, with some quotations around it, um, does demonstrate our willingness to address this issue and to work uh, collaboratively with all of the individuals that are already doing uh, work in this space and then to continue to work with the housing advocates like yourself uh, to bring the best care, um, specialized care to those individuals. So thank you for your continued advocacy, excuse me. I have just one final comment, if, if I may. Um, I would just ask um, that you consider that these 13 people really had a lot of community support, and we have so many other people out there living in tents and on the land that don't have Absolutely. community support. So um, just Absolutely. wanted to bring that up as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any additional questions or comments at this time? Yes, Council uh, President. Uh, Council Member, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would just also say, and I think that last point was really important um, that, that was just raised, that this ordinance and this this issue that we're bringing forward is a pilot and it is a it, it serves to fix this specific issue what we're talking about is a systemic system wide issue in our city around unhoused residents and so we need to as we use this as a pilot we really need to challenge us as a city and a community to come together to to formulate a scalable plan uh, around um, uh, our unhoused and uh, and these issues aren't going away and they're not getting any easier. And when we specifically talk about those folks who are, who are living on the land, these are the most difficult usually to house uh, and find solutions for. And that means that we are gonna need everybody at the table to come up with this, this solution. Um, it is not easy. We are talking to folks all across the country. Um, no one is doing a stellar job of this, um, which means that we have an opportunity to um, uh, make this better and make a Columbus uh, solution. But um, this is not an overnight solution. And this alone, even this funding, this plan is not a silver bullet to solve this issue. Um, and and it's, it's not, it's not sustain, sustainable, truthfully, in its current form. So we're going to really need to, to come together and use the advocacy that came out of Mound Street to grow um, into a community, a larger conversation. Um, because this is as much connected to um, how we zone and build more housing as it is um, just for um, sites um, that folks are, are living on the, on the land. And we need folks in part of all of those conversations um, if we're really going to solve the, the, the issue. So I appreciate the department's work. I certainly appreciate the advocacy of the community um, for, for the folks living on, on Mound. But we really are going to have to continue to amplify this um, uh, as a as a citywide, community-wide conversation for all of our unhoused and homeless population. Thank you, Council President. With that, I move for um, adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Bankston. Okay. Abstain. Ms. Barosa de Padilla. Yes. Ms. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Favor. Yes. Mr. Remy. Yep. President Harden. Yes. Ordinance is passed. Thank you. That's all I have in my committees. Thank you, Madam Chair.
See no further business become before council. Is there a motion to adjourn? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa, De Padilla, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, President Hart. Council is adjourned. We'll we'll go right into non-agenda speakers. Is that cool? Um, the first speaker to come before.